Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 104, and what I'd like to do is discuss Coulomb's Law. Now, Coulomb's Law is the fact that charged particles apply a force on one another, and we're able to determine the value of that force um, directly. All we need to do is know the charges themselves of the two charged objects. We need to know how far apart they are, and we need to know what is known as the electrostatic constant. But before we get into the actual equation, let's take a step back and refresh our memories of what we probably learned in chemistry, or even before that. Now remember, we have three fundamental particles in the atom. We have the electron, the neutron, and the proton. And in chemistry, we use plus one to denote the charge of the proton, minus one for the electron, and they're equal. We also use plus one um, for the mass of the proton, um, plus one for the mass of the neutron, and zero for the mass of the electron. Now the reality is the electron does have mass, and the value is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. The proton and the neutron, although are very similar in mass, they don't have the actual same mass. But for our purposes right now, until we need to have more precision, what we're going to do is denote the mass of the proton and neutron as 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Now, instead of using the charge as plus 1 and minus 1, we'll stick to the proton having 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs and the electron having negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Neutral objects, which are called atoms, have no charge. Neutrons have no charge as well. If you have an ion, you have a net excess of electrons um, or, or a lack of electrons. And we can determine the number of extra electrons using our conversion factor or using the equation Q equals Ne. Q equals Ne. Either way, what's important is that we remember back to when we learned about protons and electrons, um, probably in elementary school, is that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. And that's going to allow us to figure out whether or not uh, force, electrostatic forces are repulsive or attractive. Now, if we refresh our memory of Newton's laws, we'll remember the law of inertia, which is an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Well, if we have two charged particles in space, what's going to happen is they are going to move apart or move closer together. And the reason they would do that if we just place them in the middle of, uh, middle of nowhere is because there has to be a force acting on it. And our Newton's second law, which is F equals MA, if we knew the acceleration, we'd be able to determine what the force is. We know the mass of the charged particles. If it's an extra proton, we knew that. If we know the electron, we know the value for that. Unfortunately, we often don't know what the acceleration will be. So what we're going to need to do is find the force first. What's also important is that we remember Newton's third law. Now, Newton's third law was every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if we have the force of an electron on a proton, that's the same force as on the proton to the electron. So the forces are equal and opposite. If they're attractive, they both act inward. If they're repulsive, they both act outward. And what we're going to be able to do is realize that these are really vectors because they're forces. And we can worry about the direction of the forces and actually use vector manipulation to find the resultant forces on the electrons or protons or whatever the charged particle happens to be. Now, Charles Coulomb was the one who came up with Coulomb's law. And he lived from 1736 to 1806. And what he did is he developed a relationship between the charged particles and the value of the force between them. He ultimately came up with the equation that we know as Coulomb's law, and he realized that the bigger the charge, the more the force, and the closer they were together, the bigger the force. It has a very similar um, appearance in terms of uh, the equation to Newton's law of universal gravitation. So there's a direct relationship between the charges themselves and an indirect square relationship between their distances. So the equation looks very similar to, like I said, Newton's law of universal gravitation. 
Because charged particles have such small forces acting on them, it was difficult for Coulomb to figure this out. And what he actually did was he built a torsion balance, which has a very small strand of, of string hanging vertically, and on the end is a rod that has where he put the charged particles. And he would notice that there was a rotation in the charged particle when he charged one of the um, either the rods or a stationary object. From that, he was able to determine, ultimately, the electrostatic constant. So a torsion balance is what he used to do his experimentation. Now, the equation for Coulomb's law is F equals K Q Q over R squared. Now, K is the electrostatic constant. And we know it is 9 times 10 to the 9 uh, newtons per meter squared over Coulomb squared. And just like Newton's law of universal gravitation, we had big G, which was Newton meter squared over kilogram squared. Similar in structure, this one is going to cancel out the Coulombs and the meters. And what we're going to be left with is the Newton. Now, Q1 and Q2 are the charges in Coulombs of each of the objects. And R is going to be the distance between them. Um, and it's, of course, it's R squared. Now, because this constant is so large, electrostatic forces can be quite big. Unfortunately, they don't really exist outside of a small area near the atom um, because charged particles are not going to be able to store up too much um, outside the atom. Electrostatic forces are big inside the atom, but it's going to be a lot smaller once we leave the atom. For example, the Earth, um, although it has a lot of protons and electrons, the net charge on the Earth typically stays at about zero. As we charge an object, even in a Van de Graaff generator, because the electrons are so small, the electrostatic force um, isn't going to amount to much in terms of pulling objects around. You could, though, uh, determine an actual force due to the electrostatic forces. Um, so gravitational and electrostatic forces can be both contributing to the forces acting on objects. And it's much larger than gravity. Um, because of the constant being 9 times 10 to the 9. However, because Q is such a small value, remember the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, the large value of the constant counteracts the small value of the charge itself. So you would need a, an immense number of extra electrons or protons in order to uh, produce a significant force. On the other hand, with the small value of the gravitational constant, 10 to the negative 11. Remember that celestial objects are huge. The sun is 10 to the 30 kilograms. So that cancels out the small value of um, you know, the, the constant and allows for gravitational forces to be uh, well as big as objects can be themselves. Remember, our sun is one of the smaller suns. It's, it's like a medium-sized star. So uh, large stars are, are tens, hundreds, thousands, even millions times the size of our sun. And just remember, for scale, there are a million Earths can fit inside of our sun alone. And our sun's one of the smaller ones. So just imagine the immense scale of our universe. Now, at this point, we're talking about electrons. So we're talking about the other end of that spectrum, the, the, the immense uh, smallness of fundamental particles. Now, unlike gravitational forces, which are always attractive, uh, electrostatic forces can be attractive or repulsive. Now, if we have two like charges and we multiply the Q, that's going to result in a positive answer. If we have two negatives, that becomes positive. If we have two positives, that's also positive. So if your electrostatic force is a positive result, that means that your forces are repulsive. If you multiply a positive and negative value together, you're always going to get a negative. So if you have a negative answer for your force, it's always going to, be, going to be an attractive force. So depending upon the size of the electrostatic force, you can determine if it's attractive or repulsive. So it's just one other thing we have to worry about when dealing with electrostatic forces. It's not always attractive like gravity. Now at this point, that concludes our discussion of Coulomb's Law. I think it's about time that we put Coulomb's Law into practice and we do some whiteboard examples now. Thank you. All right, we have the fundamental particles, which we discussed before, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. 
Now the proton and the neutron exist within the nucleus and the electron is outside the nucleus. And we have the charge on the electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs and it's a negative. The proton has a charge of positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs and the neutron obviously because it's neutral has zero charge. So these are the charges. Now in chemistry you typically call the proton and neutron a mass of one and the electron zero. But they all do have masses. The electron has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And the mass of the proton and neutron are just about the same. It's 1.67 as each other times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms and 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Now those are the values that are listed in the reference table. But if we need more precision, when we talk about modern physics, we'll get even more precise and we'll see that the neutron is slightly larger than the proton. But you have to go out a number of decimal places to see that difference. So for now, we have the fundamental particles of the electron, proton, and neutron. You can't get any smaller than that. Although we'll find later that the quark is actually uh, a smaller particle than these. So we have broken them into smaller pieces. And their charges, electron and proton have the same but equal sign. Neutrons uh, neutral, so it's zero. And the mass of the electron is 9.11 to, to the negative 31 kilograms. It's very small. Um, and the proton and neutron are just about 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms each. Neutrons slightly larger, but with this kind of precision, they're equivalent. The formula is F equals K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And F is the electrostatic force. Ooh, not with a P, with an F. So force, and that's going to be in newtons. K is the electrostatic constant. And it's 9 times 10 to the 9 newton times meter squared over coulomb squared. And that allows us to cancel out the two coulombs on the top and the two meters on the bottom. Q is the charge of each object, and that's going to be measured in coulombs, so 1 and 2 each object, and then R is the distance between them. Distance between the objects, and we're going to measure that in meters. So. This has a very similar look to the um, gravitational force, which was what I call the big G equation, G, M, M over R squared. So the same format, but obviously the K and the G, the constants, are significantly different. And in the force equation, um, you have mass. Now, for the electrostatic force for Coulomb's law, if you multiply two like charges, you end up with a positive answer. If you multiply two unlike charges, you end up with a negative answer. So if your force becomes positive, what that means is you have repulsion. So they push each other apart. If you have a negative value, you have attraction. Now that's different from the gravitational force because it was always an attractive force. So gravity always pulls objects together, whereas electrostatic forces can be repulsive or attractive, depending upon the situation. 